Jessica Gia, park ranger with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And how did I get here? Well, funny story. When I started school, I thought I'd be an engineer. I thought I'd be an architect. And then I saw this cool internship that said, hey, you want to work at a wildlife refuge? And I thought, well, that's cool. I don't know what that is. So I went. I did an internship. I fell in love with it. I didn't know that you could actually make a job out of listening to birds all morning. It is incredible. So I just did internship after internship until I got my foot in the door and here I am, your bonafide park ranger at this beautiful wetland where I help visitors like you enjoy the natural resources and our animal heritage. Hey everyone, we are live from Anahuac Wildlife Refuge. I'm park ranger Jessica Gia and I have a really cool chubby guest for you. So this chonkers here is, you guessed it, a very hungry caterpillar. And as you can see, this caterpillar is about the size of my finger. What is it gonna turn into? Is it gonna turn into a beautiful, beautiful butterfly? Actually, this type of caterpillar is gonna turn into a sphinx moth, which if you've never seen a sphinx moth, you are missing out. Sphinx moths are huge. I don't know if you can see this, but this sphinx moth is on my friend's skirt right here. It is maybe the size of my phone. So this caterpillar is gonna spend its time eating its heart out every day, all day, eating. And then one day when it decides the time is right, it will turn into a moth. And as a moth, it might not even eat at all. That's why it would eat all of it needs to eat when it's a baby, caterpillar. I mean, this is a cute baby, right? And then once it turns into a moth, it might spend all of its time looking for a mate, but none of its time eating. So that's like, imagine if you only ate until you graduated high school and then never ate it ever again. That's what we're looking at here. So our sphinx moth caterpillar might also be known as a horn worm. You might see these big things on your tomato plants. They are also gonna turn into moths. They are totally harmless as moths, but some gardeners aren't very happy that they're super hungry and eat all their plants. But we love these because they are a vital part of our ecosystem out here. And they feed so many things and they're just beautiful. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Tiny Snake Show. Our guest today is a Decay's Brown Snake, which most people think is a baby snake, but actually this is a full grown adult Decay's Brown Snake. Why is it so tiny? Well, this snake is really tiny because its niche or place in the animal world is to eat insects. So a decays brown snake mostly lives on the ground and eats small little things like slugs, like little tiny beetles, like snails. It is a voracious predator of all things very small. There we go. And why is the snake so squirmy? Because it's scared. If you were here, you would also be able to smell that it smells funky. And that's because one of the snake's defense mechanisms is to poop on you so that you don't think it tastes good. And I have to tell you, it's, it's true. I don't think the snake is gonna taste good because it smells terrible, but it's totally harmless and ready to be a part of a healthy ecosystem and food chain. Just like this snake eats insects, other things are gonna eat these snakes. And then soon, before you know it, you have birds, you have bobcats, you have all these giant animals that started out as part of one big food web of life. Say bye. Hey everyone, Jessica Gia here at Anahuac Wildlife Refuge. And I have with me our superstar, Andy the Amphiuma. Say hi, Andy, wave your little arm. Can you see him? Andy is a strange creature, as you can tell. Now you might be thinking, why is this snake underwater? He's not a snake. He is a really cool salamander. That's right. Andy is actually a salamander. 
a salamander who happens to look like a giant gray tube with teeny, teeny, tiny legs. And if you can see his legs, he has three toes. So scientists cleverly named him a three-toed Amphiuma. There's two-toed Amphiumas and one-toed Amphiuma. So the next time you see an Amphiuma, ask it to wave at you and count its toes. If you can see Andy's face, Andy has really cloudy eyes, and that's because Amphiumas live under the water, under the mud. They might even be in your yard, but you wouldn't know because they like to be buried and submerged at the same time. So he doesn't really need his eyes. Instead, he uses a lot of chemosensory tools, like these little dots all over his face. Those dots are chemosensors. They can detect movement of other things in the water. He doesn't need eyes. He doesn't even need light. He can sense these really cool little dots, and the dots go all along his body. Oh, I just hit the camera with Andy. All right, Andy. Oh, he's coming for a breath of air. Now, Andy, being a salamander, breathes air like a normal salamander would. He just happens to like living underwater. So he comes up like a whale, like a big, tuby, noodle-shaped whale to get air. All right. Andy is also heavy, so I'm going to put him down. Thanks for watching. Hi, friends. My name is Stephanie Martin. And I'm the Outdoor Recreation Planner at the Anahuac National Wildlife Refuge. So what does that mean? That means my job is to help people in the outdoors recreate, basically. So we do classes, we have the kids come out, we do tours, I work with volunteers, I do a lot of super fun things. And the reason I got this job is because I just loved biology. That was my favorite subject. I knew I wanted to go to college, and so I got my degree biology. Then after that, I heard about this great internship out here. I came here and I did my internship. And then I did a couple of temporary jobs. And then now I've been here at my permanent job for 20 years. And I love every day. Hi friends, I'm Stephanie Martinez. I work out at the Anahuac National Wildlife Refuge. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about wetlands. So what are wetlands? Very very simple definition. A wetland is land that's wet. Shot. So, a wetland has water on the land some or most of the year. So, it's an ecotone. It's the overlapping of two different types of habitat. The land habitat and the water habitat. So, so many different critters can live there. Very, very diverse. I have a poster that just shows some of the incredible animals that can live in a wetland. So, we, def we have the definition of a wetland, wetland. There are different types of wetlands. There's a bog, there's a marsh, and there's a swamp. Swamps are usually big trees in the wetland, whereas marshes are typically grassy, and they're dominant, dominantly have grass. And so, Anahuac Refuge has mostly marsh. What kinds of marsh do we have? We have different types. We have freshwater marsh, saltwater marsh, and brackish marsh, which is the overlapping of fresh and salt water. So each type of marsh has different animals that live there. Some of them overlap, but in general, freshwater critters are in freshwater, and the saltwater critters are in the salt water. So we talk a lot about wetlands. Why do we care about them? Why do I care about them? Why should you care about them? Well, I'll tell you, they're super cool. So wetlands do a number of things that help people. So one thing they do is they slow down floodwaters. So if there's a big flood coming from a hurricane, this has been a very busy year, they will slow down that flood water coming from a hurricane. If there's uh, water coming from the north, a lot of rain, and it's coming down the bayous, marshes on the sides of the bayous will slow down that water too. Not only do they slow down water, but they also trap fil and filter pollutants and debris. So we used to have a storm here 
called Hurricane Ike. And it was in 2008, and it was a very, very big storm. And what happened was when the storm came in from the Gulf, it knocked down a lot of houses. And so when it did that, we had a lot of debris on the refuge. So the marsh captured some of that debris and helped to protect Houston and the other cities around here. So when they filter stuff, they also slow down the water, which enables the water to trickle through to the water table. So the water table is underneath and that provides our drinking water. If the water's going slowly over a marsh, it has time to trickle down there and replenish our water table. So they're really, really beneficial. Another thing they're good for is they provide a little nursery for baby animals. If you like shrimp or crab or fish, the baby animals will live in the marshes because the big animals can't get into the shallow area. So the baby animals are protected by that shallow water and the grasses that protect them and they live there till they're big enough to go out into the Gulf of Mexico. Another thing they're good for is just to have fun and recreation. You can fish, you can go bird watching in there. There's a lot of cool critters you can go looking at wildlife around the marsh. So I'm going to show you a demonstration that shows what I talked about, shows that the water is slower, that it filters the debris, that it filters pollution. So when I said something about Hurricane Ike, we had all those houses on the Bolivar Peninsula, unfortunately, they were knocked down. And the refuge had a lot of refrigerators of all things. We had a lot of wood and shoes, stuff like that. But the refrigerator sticks out in my mind because they were just all over the place. Every house has a refrigerator and it's an airtight box that floated on the water. So what I've done is I've put a few refrigerators or rocks to represent them in my cup of water. This is gonna be my hurricane water. Another thing that flood waters do is they grab a lot of the grass and the habitat when they go across the water they get a lot of grass in it. So this is two examples of flood water. And if you look at the map, you can picture that I am gonna be the hurricane coming from the Gulf of Mexico. And then you, as the audience, you're gonna be all the houses that live up here. Now, which would you rather have between you and the hurricane, me? Would you rather have nice marsh to slow the water and filter the water? Or would you rather just have a parking lot or concrete where the water can just rush across and slam into your house? Well, I know y'all would pick the marsh, so would I. So I will show you this demonstration. Remember, we've got our flood water here. We've got some debris, some grass, some dirt, and I'm gonna mix it up. You can see that it's an equal amount because we also talked about how the marshes absorb water. So I will be the hurricane coming, and you are gonna be the houses. And I much, I, I know that you would rather have the marsh between us. Okay, here we go. Okay, what happened? So you can see that the water is slowly going across the marsh. You can see the water just slammed into this area over here. Much faster, much more debris. Look how much debris was captured by the mark. Let's see if it minimized the water. Let's see if there's less water in here versus over here. And I know you can see right away how much dirtier the water is too. I haven't even put all that debris in there. Look at that. This is gonna hit your house or this is gonna hit your house, which would you prefer? Of course, you would want less water to come to your house, so the marshes are gonna help to protect your house. Got it? Thank you. So, he would wave by, but his legs are too tiny.